Now that I've had a chance to show you how each of these five torques are created and work individually, I want you to see them all at the same time so you can begin to appreciate how they come together to help you run as fast and efficient as humanly possible. But instead of just flashing them up on the screen all at once, I'm going to put them back into our images here, one at a time, since that will provide me with the opportunity to do a quick review of them before taking you further along this path. So beginning with the first one, you will recall it was generated by the right leg from the action of the gluten hams, quads, and calves. And we found it was going in the counterclockwise direction seen here. And I'm also going to write it down below seen here. And you will notice I place a little number one near this torque. And that's simply for easy reference as we go. Also, and to try to keep my images as clean as possible, I'm not going to write the letters CCW for counterclockwise and CW for clockwise next to each and every torque. But instead, I'm going to make a little key here in the middle, showing that everything in red is a counterclockwise torque and everything shown in yellow is a clockwise torque. And again, this will prevent my images from getting too cluttered going forward. Now, the second torque I showed you was generated by the left leg and we found it was going in the clockwise direction seen here now in yellow. And I'm going to write this down below also in yellow and name it the left hip flexors since that was the main muscle group producing this rotational force on that side of the body. And again, I'll get into more detail about all of the individual muscles that make up each of these torques in a later video. Moving on, the third torque I showed you was generated by the right arm and we found it was going in the counterclockwise direction, back to the color red, and I'm going to write this one down below and name it the right shoulder flexors, since that was the main muscle group producing this rotational force on this side of the body. The fourth torque I showed you was generated by the left arm, and we found it too was going in the counterclockwise direction, and I'm going to write this one down below in red and name it the left shoulder extensors, since that was the main muscle group producing this rotational force on that side of the body. Now, before moving on to the last torque, I'm going to go ahead and draw the path of this one out just a bit wider, as well as all the way around until it meets up with the other red counterclockwise torques in front. And the reason I am doing this is so that you will be able to see its relationship with them a little better here in just a minute. And the fifth torque I showed you was produced by muscles acting along the spine and torso. And we found it was also going in the counterclockwise direction. And I'm going to write this down below in red and name it the right spine rotators, since that was the main muscle group producing this rotational force on that side of the body. Now with our athletes in their present configurations, we see that four of these five torques shown in red are trying to spin the body in a counterclockwise direction and only one of them, shown in yellow, is trying to spin it in a clockwise direction. So let's talk about the four red ones first and turn our attention over to the male athlete since what I'm about to say will be much easier for you to see and follow while looking at him from above. These four red torques consist of one from the right leg powered by the glutes and hams, quads and calves, one from the right arm powered by the shoulder flexors, one from the left arm powered by the shoulder extensors, and one from the side of the spine and torso, powered by the right spine rotators. Since all four of them are trying to twist his body in the same counterclockwise direction, their effect is then cumulative, meaning their individual strengths get added together, twisting him even harder in the same counterclockwise direction than any one of them can do by themselves. This principle of adding similar torques together for the purpose of increasing their overall effect on an object applies to other types of forces working in the same direction as well. For example, the force applied by a stack of weights to a cable is increased in direct proportion to the amount of weight being added underneath. Again, it's the same principle. So because these four torques are working together, their effect is once again cumulative. And so we could put a plus sign between them all down below since that is exactly what is happening with them. Now, these same four red colored torques on our female athlete are likewise also combining to try and twist her even harder in the same counterclockwise direction. And that should be easier for you to envision. 
Now let's talk about the one yellow clockwise torque and turn our attention once again to the male athlete. We see that it is powered by the left hip flexors. And since this is the only torque working in this direction, it must be strong enough all by itself to push back against the combined strength of the other four with equal strength in order to keep the athlete traveling in a straight line path, such as the black line on the floor for our male athlete or within the proper lane as for our female athlete. Therefore, we can place an equal sign down below here, showing how the strength of this one yellow clockwise torque is equivalent to the strength of these four red counterclockwise torques. Or another way of looking at this is we can simply say the strength of all of the clockwise torques must be equal to the strength of all of the counterclockwise torques if the goal of the person is to move forward in a straight path. This equation, showing how these five torques work together when you run, is what I call the ultimate running speed equation. Now, I still have to show it to you with the athlete's arm and leg positions reversed to help refine your understanding of these torques even more. However, everything on the screen in front of you is in place for you to begin seeing and believing what your body will ultimately need to run its very best. Speaking of seeing and believing, whenever I work with someone and this ultimate running speed equation is finally revealed to them, they always have a lot of good questions for me and I find that very exciting. And the reason is because it tells me they are starting to break free from the old traditional one-dimensional mindset about what it takes to get faster, which for many has always been to simply hammer away on the glutes and hams, quads and calves during their workouts and are now waking up, becoming more aware there are plenty of other things they could be doing to help themselves. And I suspect you too may be starting to have a few good questions of your own after seeing this ultimate running speed equation. And if so, that's great news because it means you, like they, are beginning to break free from similar performance inhibiting beliefs and are now more open to discovering new ways to help yourself. Now, of the many good questions I get, the most important one from my experience has always been, what happens if one side of this equation is stronger than the other? In other words, what happens if, say, the combined strength of the four red counterclockwise torques is greater than the strength of the one yellow clockwise torque like this? Then what? Well, the most important thing you have to understand about this ultimate running speed equation is that it is an equation of balance, an equation of torque balance. This means your body is going to do everything it possibly can to keep both sides of it equal when you run. Otherwise, the stronger side will constantly force you to over-rotate like this or like this, causing you to waste valuable time and energy trying to recover from this strength imbalance. So to prevent this from happening, the weak side doesn't just spontaneously get stronger, but rather, your body will automatically compensate for this weakness, this torque imbalance, whether you want it to or not, by reducing the strength of the stronger side down to match the strength of the weaker side. This is done so you can at least run under control without over-rotating and with some reasonable form. However, as you might have guessed, your speed, it's coming right down with it and there's nothing you can do about it. This is a lot like having an injury to your knee or ankle or even your shoulder. You won't be able to generate the level of torque required from the injured extremity or extremities to play at full speed. So your body adjusts to these weaknesses, these weak links, by lowering the torques produced by the other healthy areas down to match the level of the injured ones to maintain proper balance. The problem is when you are not injured and this drop in torque output occurs, it's not easy to pick up on because it feels kind of natural. And the only thing you really feel is the frustration of not being able to run as fast as you think you should. These are the athletes who complain of being stuck in first gear when they run and can't figure out why. It's because their level of torque balance is being suppressed by a weakness in one or more of these five areas of their bodies. And perhaps this is most common for those athletes who can squat and deadlift a lot of weight which in our example here affects torque number one where the glutes and hams, quads and calves are involved but have very weak hip flexors producing torque in the opposite direction. 
these athletes won't be able to fully appreciate the force their glutes and hams, quads and calves put out if the rest of the body is not in balance. So as you can imagine, there's a lot more to talk about regarding this ultimate running speed equation and how we can learn from it to help us get faster. And I'll do my best to include as many tips and insights about it as I can throughout the remainder of this video, as well as the ones to follow. But right now, I wanna move on and show you these five torques with the position of the athlete's arms and legs reversed because, like I said a moment ago, this will help to further refine your understanding as to why they are all critically needed to run your very best. But before I do, I wanna direct your attention back to the hip flexors for a moment and point out that not only do we see them working all alone here in yellow to oppose the other four red torques, they always work alone regardless of which side of the body they are flexed on. And so you will see a similar pattern coming up next when we switch the arm and leg positions around. And that's the first little tip I want you to keep in mind as we go forward. All right, that's going to do it for this video. You can access the link to the next part in this series, as well as all 12 parts in the description below. Now, before I go, I wanna say that if you liked my video, then please click the like button, feel free to share it wherever you want, and leave me a question or comment as I'll be sure to get to it as soon as possible. Also, if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe to this channel and follow Athletic Quickness on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to stay up to date on all of our speed training tips, articles, and exercises. Okay, that's all I have for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.